Hello, I'm Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast to get you thinking about biblical and historical Christianity, to challenge you to follow Christ, and to inspire you to lead a consecrated life. This is part two of my series with Bill Schlegel, former professor of the Israel Bible Extension and longtime Bible teacher and geography expert. Last time we discussed five major texts in the Gospel of John, and this time we'll cover five more. Here now is Interview 44, Misunderstood Texts About Jesus, part two. All right, well, let's move on to the next one, which is John 10.30. And uh, yes. this one ranked number one on a website called Bible Reasons under the article, Jesus is God. I just want to read out what it says here. It says, quote, If anyone tries to tell you that Jesus is not God in the flesh, close your ears, because anyone who believes that blasphemy will not enter into heaven. Jesus said, if you do not believe I am he, you will die in your sins. If Jesus wasn't God, how could he die for our sins? End quote. And then uh, they list out about, oh, I don't know, 25 texts. And uh, number one on that entire list of 25 is John 1030. Huh. The Father and I are one. And, uh, even be John 1-1, one, one, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, some of these okay. li- lists are pretty arbitrary. Uh, John 1-1 one, one doesn't come in until number 8 there on that oh, list. Uh, okay. But uh, obviously this is just one person's opinion on <laughs> how, what, what they think is so worthwhile. But this has really been a go-to verse for so many folks, and so is this attitude that says, I, I shouldn't even listen to to anyone because if I listen to another perspective other than the classic Trinitarian point of view of the established Catholic and Protestant churches, then my salvation might be lost. So maybe you can handle both of those and just uh, give people a a reason why they should not just turn off the podcast right here and uh, help us think through John 10.30 as well. Well, one thing I would say is that expression shows certain degree of insecurity, if your position is so insecure that you, you don't, can't hear another suggestion, I think deep down inside it, it's showing you're not really sure. Right? Right. You're not really sure how you could have three persons in one essence, and one of those essences has two natures. Right? The dual-natured God-man, it's a problem. And people are deep down inside, they're unsure about it. It doesn't work. It doesn't. It's not. It's not something we are accustomed to. It's not something we see in reality. And in the end, it is a. It's a myth. Right? This is one of the things I've always told students in the past. As Peter says, we have not followed cleverly devised myths. Okay, and the idea of a God man, fully God and fully man, people know that it doesn't sit right. They've got to go to mystery, and they've got to go to, I don't want to hear any different. And if that's your position, then, you know, I'm, uh, you know just keep reading the scriptures and, and seek God. You may not be so interested in the truth as you claim you are. Okay, let's, let's take a little closer look at uh, John 10, 30 then. Well, first of all, no, it's the Feast of Hanukkah in Jerusalem, verse 22 of John 10, okay? Feast of Dedication. Now, this is in December. That this is like four months before Jesus will be crucified. Now, note they ask him, "Tell us, don't you know how long are you going to keep us in suspense?" In verse twenty-four, are you the Mashiach? Are you the Anointed? And unfortunately, in the English, Christ we don't know what it means. It means anointed. It means somebody else has designated you. Somebody else has anointed you. It already shows that Jesus is not God. If he is anointed, then he's not God. He's the anointed of God, or anointed by God. So now here they are, four months before he's going to be crucified. They're not saying, hey, are you God? You're claiming to be God? No. uh -uh. Right? If you want to say that he was claiming to be God back there in John 5 or something, uh, here they are in John 10, four months before he's going to be crucified. Are you the Mashiach? Tell us plainly. This is what they know that Jesus was claiming to be. Okay? Now, how does Jesus answer? He says, I already told you. 
If you don't want to believe my words, believe my works. Because the works that I do are evidence. And these works, he's done two, really, in, the, in Jerusalem, in the Gospel of John. He did two. He healed the layman, the pools of Bethesda. How do you say that in English? <laughs> Bethesda. Yeah, the pools of Bethesda. And he healed the blind man just not so long ago, at a festival of tabernacles probably, in the, at the pool of Siloam. Okay, very interesting. I think there's a geographical reason why he did those two miracles where he did them, both in pools. But we'll leave that for another time. So here he is now. He did two miracles in Jerusalem. They've heard about his other miracles and so forth. But John, interesting, John's the only one who records the miracles that Jesus did in Jerusalem. Search the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, Luke. See if you can find a miracle that Jesus did in Jerusalem. There's one. There's one little verse, but we'll leave that for another place. Uh -huh. Okay, so here in John... He, he's saying, Look, believe the works, okay? The works that I'm doing are showing you that I'm the Messiah, not that I'm God. As John will tell us, he wrote these works, many works Jesus did, but I wrote these down so that you will believe that Jesus is the Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Son of God. And you've got to know what Son of God means. It's not God the Son, okay? This king, this designated king, this is why John is writing these events down so that we believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. So here they're telling him, tell us plainly, just I told you already. And if you're not going to believe my words, just look at the works. You've got evidence. And he goes into this idea of keeping the sheep. And he keeps the sheep. He's not going to lose the sheep. And the Father, who is greater than everyone, right? no one's able to take a sheep out of his hand. And then verse 30, I and the Father are one. Okay. Is he claiming again essence? By the way, this doesn't really work so well for Trinitarianism either. Why is if that? Anything, if anything, it's more of a oneness verse. Ah. Most of my Trinitarian uh, friends don't even know what oneness is. I didn't know what oneness was. Yeah, well, there's can... several million people that believe in, right, that there's one God who manifests himself in different ways. Okay? So for the Trinitarian, really, to say that, that Jesus and the Father are, are one, it doesn't really work because they're supposed to be two different persons. So Jesus could be meaning something different here. And I, I think it's quite obvious that he is. He is one with the Father in purpose and intention, right? He's one with the Father in how they're working together. I think you've said the word function. Yes. Right? So this is what he means. He and the, and the Father are on the same purpose. They are one in purpose. Jesus will pray later. There's a certain unity in, this, in the idea. Jesus will pray, pray later that his followers would be one. This is John chapter 17. May they be one, even as you and I are one. May they be one with us. It's not in essence. It's in purpose and intention and in unity. Absolutely. If you look at verse 27, it says that uh, the sheep hear Jesus' voice, and he gives them eternal life. No one will snatch him out of his hand. 29, uh, no one's going to snatch him out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one in protecting the sheep so that no one can touch the sheep. I mean, it, th this is not metaphysical. This is not philosophy. This is a father and his anointed one, his son, who are doing a job. You know, what are they doing? They're, they're gathering out from the people those who are willing to believe, those who are willing to follow. And mm -hmm. he's saying that in the presence of the people who disbelieve in him and who are so befuddled and frustrated with their inability to stop his popularity from growing and have already tried all the old, old tricks on him. They've tried to outsmart him, outmaneuver him, spread lies about him, blackball him, say that he's working by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, because they couldn't deny the miracles. They've done everything they could think to do, and yet Jesus still rises in popularity. And mm -hmm. it seems like they, there's nothing they can do to touch him. And that explodes in the next verse here, verse 31, where it says the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Here, once again, we have the same problem that we mentioned before, Bill, where it says, uh, Jesus says, well, why are you going to stone me? I mean, I've done all these good works. Which good work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, what's, 
What's your problem, man? And then verse 33, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. So right. here, once again, the Jews are claiming that Jesus is claiming to be God, and, the, and yet the apologists, the Christian apologists today will seize upon this verse, verse 33, and say, look, the Jews interpreted what Jesus said in verse 30, I and the Father are one, as meaning that he, being a man, makes himself out to be God. So how would you respond to verse 33 here, Bill? Well, let's not agree with whoever these religious leaders are. By the way, the word Jews, often in the book of John, it means the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Because in, in the Gospel of John, there's, and also the synoptics, there's a, there's a play on Galilee versus Judea. And we got to remember that Peter is a Jew, John himself is a Jew. So there's not all Jews. We can't just say the Jews said this and the Jews did that. Okay, the Gospel of John, it's talking about Judeans, the Judeans, particularly the religious leadership. Now, again, we're not going to, are we going to agree with their interpretation? I know exactly what you're saying. Many people say, oh, see, they understood what Jesus was saying. No, they didn't. The Gospel of John tells us very clearly that they didn't understand what he was saying. And Jesus, even in the rest of this passage, upbraids them for not understanding what he was saying. And first of all, it is interesting to note that the word God there in verse 33 doesn't have the definite article. Like normally, oh, that's interesting. In, the Greek, in the Greek text, the word for the Almighty God does. It might be significance. They might be saying you're making yourself out to be some kind of a special god or with a small g or some special power or godly, right, or divine, these kinds of things. I don't believe that the Jewish religious leaders ever blame Jesus for being God in any other place. Maybe this one. Not in John chapter 5. Uh -uh. Maybe this one. But here he, he clarifies for them. They misinterpret him. He answers He's going to appeal to Psalm 82, right? He says, is it not written in your law? It's Psalm 82. I said, you are gods. Now, what is Psalm 82? Psalm 82 is a reference to the Jewish people themselves or their elders to whom the word of God came. God gave the Jews the scriptures, like Paul says in Romans. Right. He gave the Jewish people the oracles because this is his revelation to us mankind of what is right what is the path to go on this is what torah means the word we often translate in english as law right the law of moses is torah it means direction it means teaching you go this way you're going to have life god gave that to the jews and psalm 82 god himself is upbraiding the jewish leaders i believe in this case saying look at you had the oracles of god and I called you gods, right? He calls them gods, Psalm 82. And, and by the way, this is, this, I believe this passage is misinterpreted, and I, I hear it a lot more recently that uh, there's a claim that Psalm 82 is referring to some heavenly court and other gods and, and this kind of thing. Now, Psalm 82, Jesus very clearly interprets it for us. This is referring to the, the Jewish leaders to whom the oracles of God came. They're called gods. And then Jesus makes a all the more so argument. If they're called gods, and they are. We all know, too, that Moses was even called God. God said, I'm making you a god to Pharaoh. Right. I'm making you god to your brother Aaron. It's Elohim. It's the word Elohim. It's the word God. So there are others that are called gods. And our friend Dale Tuggy uh, has a nice uh, podcast on the different uses of the word Elohim. does a really good job differentiating. And showing that in this case, yes, the Jewish leaders, the Jewish people to whom the word of God came were called gods. I think it's related to power, too. Sometimes the word Elohim relates to having authority, okay, having authority or power. Now, Jesus says, no, no, no. Our leaders to whom the word of God came were called gods, as it says in Psalm 82. Are you going to say of him whom the Father consecrated, that means set apart, sent into the world. We know it's sent into the world. It doesn't mean from heaven. It means it's God behind him, just like there was a man sent from God, John the Baptist. Are you going to say of him, this special one whom God has designated, you're blaspheming 
because I said, I am the Son of God. Jesus clearly tells them, and I'm saying I'm not, I'm not saying I'm God. I said I'm the Son of God. Right. And we know what the Son of God means in a biblical understanding, a biblical meaning. It means the designated Messiah, King, descended from David, who's going to rule this earth. Now, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, here's another problem with Trinitarianism. And I suppose probably oneness too. Honestly, Sean, the God the Son disappears. Because Jesus keeps saying over and over again, I'm doing these works by the Father. It's the Father who does his works in me. What happened to God the Son? In the Trinitarian idea, Jesus was able to do these things and be who he was because he's God the Son. But God the Son is out of the picture for sure in the book of John because Jesus keeps saying over and over again, the works that I do, are the works of God the Father. Okay? The words that I speak are the words of the Father. God the Son has just disappeared from the scene in the book of John. So he says, I am doing the works of the Father. And I said, I am the Son of God. Right. All right, well, let's move on to John 17. I think I'm going to, I'm going to skip this uh, John 13, because it's really the same as John 8, 58, anyhow. Okay. Uh, let's go on to John 17, verse 5, and this is a text that sometimes comes up where it says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So a typical way of interpreting this is to say that in his pre existent or pre-incarnate state that Jesus shared in the glory of God, and uh, that also if we look in some Old Testament texts like in Isaiah in the 40s there, he says he doesn't share his glory with anyone else. Therefore, Jesus must have pre-existed as God the Son, enjoying the same glory as God the Father, and of course God the Holy Spirit, if you want to throw the uh, third one in there. But uh, mm-hmm. what what's your take on this now? Well, several things. Maybe the very first thing is to look at John 17, 3. I don't think there's a clear statement from Jesus concerning who he is and who God the Father is in the scriptures, where he's praying to the Father. As he starts out in verse 1, he's praying to the Father, and he says, this is eternal life, that they know you, right, Father, the only true God and Jesus, the Messiah, whom you have sent. All right? Jesus says that the Father is the only true God. So however we're going to interpret John 17, 5, we can't contradict with what Jesus just said, that the Father is the only true God. That's such a powerful statement. I really am at a loss to know what other interpretations there are. I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're out there, but it's just like such a strong statement where Jesus calls his Father, to whom he's in prayer, according to verse 1, the only true God, and then Mm -hmm. excludes himself from that designation by saying, and Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. I mean, mean, really powerful. And then you you add to that, uh, I know we we jumped over it, but 1428, where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I. Mm -hmm. I mean, so he identifies the Father as the only true God. He says, the Father is greater than I. And probably another five or so texts within the Gospel of John, all throughout, Jesus says over and over, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. I can do nothing on my own initiative. The words that I speak, I'm speaking just as he commanded me. The works that I do, I do because of the Father who dwells within me. I mean, over and over and over, Jesus is saying, look guys, it's not me. It's not me, it's him, it's God, he's awesome, I'm, I'm doing what he told me to do, but it's really his idea, his power, his wisdom that you're seeing here. I mean, it's yep. really a major, I would say, theme in the Gospel of John. You know, as you're speaking, Sean, another thing I'm thinking of is you can really see, especially in the Trinitarian concept, that Trinitarianism is a doctrine of inference. There right. is no place in the Bible where the Trinity is explained, not to mention a verse if God is three in persons in one essence, it should be chapter after chapter. Jesus should have been explaining it on the Sermon on the Mount. Paul should have de- designated a whole book to it, 
over and over again. It's not there. It's all these sort of little clues here and there. You've got to pick this verse. You've got to pick that verse and put it all together. But even in this verse, where many Trinitarians have drawn my attention to it in recent times, there's nothing here about three-person Godhead. Even if you want to say Jesus pre-existed here, literally, which I don't think uh, John 17.5 is talking about a literal pre-existence, it doesn't say he's God. This could have been an angel that was a glory, had some glory before, and I'm sure that the Arians and the uh, proto-Orthodox people argued over this verse, and, you know, because you can argue it either way. So there's nothing about the deity of Jesus here. It's only you're inferring that if you want to say that uh, 17.5 proves uh, that he's God. It's only, it really is, it's a doctrine of inference. And I think somehow we, we lose the big picture in all this. When we look at the Gospel of John, Jesus, the Messiah, is a man standing there, in this case, praying somewhere between the upper room and he's on his way to Gethsemane. He's a human being standing there. And we somehow get this picture of some indwelt, honestly, possessed, some God, some pre-existent God part, possessed this piece of flesh, Jesus. I mean, it sounds crude, but that's, that's almost how we're viewing him. Yeah, he, He's a human being. Now, I think what Jesus is doing here, he's praying. And he's praying, saying that he's finished the work. But one thing is, we know he hasn't really finished the work yet. He's about, he's going to die soon, but he hasn't really finished it. But he is, he's going to. And he's asking now for the glory. That's what been planned, that he had with God the Father in the sense of a purpose and intention and plan of God. And Jesus knows that that glory is his destiny, if you would. It's maybe not the best biblical word to use. He, he sees it. He knows it, that this has been planned from the beginning. And now he's going to finish and that glory will be given to him, right? It's given to him. It's not his own. It's given to him. I, I think it's fair to say uh, through, who's, through who he is and through his obedience, he did the work which the Father gave him to do. And we can see the same idea in the continuation of this prayer, in verse 24, where Jesus is praying for people of a future generation to his time that they would have glory. And here's what he says in verse 24. Father... I desire that they also, that is these future believers, they also, whom you have given me. It's already been done, right? He's praying in the future. May be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. You have in John, in the rest of this prayer, where you have the idea of people that are not even yet born will receive glory, or they have glory. 24 has significance, but 22 as well. Here he's praying for this, these future believers, a later generation. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. What? They're not even alive yet. And he has given it to them? It's the idea of it's as good as done. In the Hebrew mind, that's, this is a real legitimate possibility. Even in the, the Old Testament language, you have the prophets that will use a past tense verb in describing something in the future. Why? Because in God's plan, it's going to happen. If God says it, it's going to be. And watch, right? It's as good as done kind of idea. So here's Jesus in the same chapter saying, the glory which you've given me, I have given to them, they're not even born yet, that they may be one even as we are one. So let's let the language of the book of John help us to understand what Jesus is saying. Yes, exactly. All right, moving on then, let's take a look at really, I think it's probably the best verse, or the strongest verse, I should say, the strongest verse on the subject of the deity of Christ in the Gospel of John, and it's John 20, 28, where Thomas, upon seeing Jesus in his resurrected body, blurts out, in verse 28, Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And uh, I don't think there's any question here that this verse is in the manuscripts. There's no translation issue. 
uh, it's really a question of interpretation. So uh, wh where do we go for this one with Brother Thomas? Thomas's words help us to understand all of the Gospel of John. If we misunderstand Thomas's words here, then perhaps we don't really understand what the Gospel of John is all about. I would suggest that Thomas is referring to two people here. Jesus is his Lord, and he understands in this resurrected from the dead human being that this is God that has done this. And how can we say this? Because over and over again in this gospel, we see that it's the Father who is at work in Jesus. And the night that Jesus was betrayed at the Passover celebration, Jesus said to Thomas, if you had known me, you would have known my father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then Philip asked to be shown the father. And with some frustration, Jesus told Philip, I'm sure Thomas is still listening. Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who remains in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. So when Jesus dies and is dead, and Thomas hasn't seen him, and he says, I won't believe unless I see, and then when he sees Jesus, he is declaring Jesus is indeed the Messiah, his Lord, and the one who raised up that dead man is his God. The Father, it finally clicked for Thomas. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's who he's declaring his God to be. The Father is the only God in the book of John. There's no such thing as God the Son. So if, if we can't understand that Thomas is saying, this is God the Father, right, behind Jesus, it's God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Thomas is now saying, I understand. Matter of fact, Jesus even told the apostles, when you see me risen from the dead, then you'll know that the Father is in me. Okay, that it's God the Father that's who I'm declaring, who I'm all about. In the beginning of this gospel, John tells us that Jesus the Son declares, reveals the Father. And now Thomas gets it. He understands Jesus is revealing the Father, the only God, as we see in John 17, 3. Now, another thing about this is this interpretation fits much better in the whole context. Because before this, in the chapter, just some verses before, when Jesus is resurrected from the dead and he meets Mary Magdalene, the first person that sees Jesus resurrected from the dead, he gives her a commission and says, go and tell my brothers that I go to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Jesus has a God, the same God as his apostles. Jesus has a father, the same father as the apostles. This makes much better sense. Another thing is, right after this declaration by Thomas, John tells us the reason why he recorded the events, among them the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Verse 30, it's the next verse. Jesus, uh, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John does not tell us that he wrote these things so that we would believe that Jesus is God, rather that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that is consistent with the rest of the New Testament. What are the reactions of the apostles to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead? That he is God? If we're honest with ourselves, when you look at the book of Acts, that is not their reaction. They never react saying, now we know you're God. They react by saying, we know that God worked in you. Acts chapter 2, verse 22 to 36, is pretty much everything we need to know to see the kingdom to come. Peter stands up and says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who is attested to you by God, through miracles, signs, and wonders, which God did through him in your midst. Thomas is recognizing that God the Father did this. 
He raised Jesus from the dead. We forget this was a dead man standing in front of Thomas. He knows his God raised that man up from the dead, a man of flesh and bone, as Luke says. Now, look at the next chapter. They're sitting around at the Sea of Galilee, and they're having a conversation. If Peter was sitting there having that conversation with Jesus, thinking he's God, it would be a totally different picture. Right. They know he's Messiah, that God has raised from the dead. So that's, this is what Thomas means. He sees the work of God in the resurrected Jesus. Yeah. So in verse 28, then, you're saying that when Thomas says, my Lord, he's recognizing Jesus as Messiah, as God's exalted one. And that when he says, my God, he's recognizing the Father within Jesus at work. I think so. Okay. Yep. I know there's other ways to understand it, but one of the main titles for Jesus is Lord. Paul always calls him Lord. Mm -hmm. This is the Adon Mashiach, the Lord Messiah. And it's confusing in English because we use this word Lord for God's personal name, Jehovah, Yahweh. It's confusing, but we can. there is the Lord Messiah, and there's the Lord God. And right. I believe he's calling Jesus his Lord, but he knows that it's his God that has raised his Lord from the dead. Hmm. All right, well, let's look at one more. Let's take a look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. And this is... Obviously not in the Gospel of John, but it's the same person who wrote it, so might as well do it. And we read in this verse, 1 John 5, 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And so folks have sometimes suggested on the basis of this verse that... Jesus is here identified as true God and eternal life. Have you looked at this one much before, or what are your thoughts on it? It's been a while. I know this is a typical Trinitarian proof text, but again, it shows me somewhat of the weakness of their position. If they're going to use a verse that all you need to do is change a comma or a referent, in this case, and say this is one of our main verses for believing that we have three persons in one God, and one of those persons has two natures. I can't keep saying that, you know, well, I can't overemphasize the fact that if we're going to have three persons in one God and one of those persons has two natures, you need a lot more explanation than one little verse at the end of First John that if you change a comma or if you change, in, like I say, a referent, uh, then it, it gives you a different meaning. Okay, it's been a while since I looked at this verse, but I have looked at it. And it says we know that the Son of God has come. And remember, this is the Messianic title. And he's given us understanding. The Lord Almighty God, Father, spoke to us through his Son. The Son revealed him to us. To know him who is true. So, who is him who is true? In this first verse, it's God the Father. Right? The Son has given us understanding to know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, according to John, and as he has recorded for us in the Gospel of John, the words of Jesus, who is the only true God. John 17, 3, Father, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. So here, the true God is referred to twice in the first part of this verse, as the, the Father is the true God. And in his, so we are in him who is true, that's God, the Almighty. And in his son, Jesus Christ. And my translation actually, I think, gets this right. I'm looking at this. This is the true God and eternal life. This is the work of the true God. The, the question is here is the word this. Some translations are going to use the word he. They're going to use the pronoun he. He is the true God, as if you're referring back to Jesus Christ. And there, the argument is the last referent is Jesus Christ. So the he of the next sentence or next statement refers to Jesus Christ. But you can see that the referent, he is the true God, goes to the previous 
referent, we want to call it that, who's told to us twice as the one who is true. It's God the Father who is true in the first part of this verse, two times. So this is the true God, refers to God the Father. It's very, I mean, let's put it this way. We can understand the verse this way very clearly. It's not a good verse to insist that you can only take this and say, here, this says that Jesus is God. Right, right. Well, I mean, the the other problem is that he's already identified the Father as true God and eternal life, as you pointed out in John seventeen three, and that might maybe be a case for oneness, but it's hard to see how this would sufficiently distinguish the Father from the Son if we did collapse them both into that uh, phrase, true God and eternal life. And uh, besides which, I mean, if the whole point in First John which is summed up in verse 20 here, is that the Son of God has come to give us an understanding to know him who is true. And then you refer back, this is the true God. I think you're right. I mean, it, it fits right in there. And this word he, I'm reading from the ESV, but this word he is the word utos, which is just the Greek word for this. I mean, sure, you can translate it as he, but there is another mm-hmm. word for he uh, that mm-hmm. is not used here. Uh, so I think it is a little easier or natural to translate it as this one. I I think a more literal translation would typically do that. And then ironically, the last verse, Bill, little children, Mm. keep yourselves from idols. And uh, sadly, so many have made an idol out of the sun, including making statues of Jesus all over this land and, and many others around the world, and worshiping Jesus in the stead of God or as God, the Almighty. It's really sad to see that. Uh, not that Jesus isn't exalted. He is the highest exalted individual in all of the universe next mm-hmm. to God. Yep. Uh, and I, I think people look at Jesus and they, you know, if they see him, Jesus is everything he says, everything he did, everything he continues to do is a pointer directing people to the Father. And what people do is instead of taking the cue from Jesus and through him and in him and by him connecting to and worshiping and glorifying the the Father and the Creator, what we do is we fixate on the finger that Jesus is pointing to God, and we say, oh, isn't that finger wonderful? And, uh, you know, I I think Jesus is wonderful, but if we're really going to be faithful to him, we need to get what he's saying and where he's directing us to go, rather than lifting him up to that position that he doesn't he has, he does not claim for himself, and that would, in a sense, eclipse the father of his supreme position in the universe. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I, I'm not prepared to say all 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 exes are going to hell or anything like that, just because that's thankfully not my job. But uh, I think verse 21 is is important to keep in mind that we want to keep ourselves from idols, and idols is making a creature into an ultimate object of worship. Yeah, or which takes the place of the one true God. Here's what I would say, Sean, and maybe just to wrap up, is as we've looked at the Gospel of John, and we insist that Jesus is the designated human Messiah, many of my friends have said something like, oh, you think Jesus is just a mere man? I've never said that. And... I don't think that. The Bible does, definitely does not say that. And here's why. It's, he's not this guy sitting next to me on the bus. He's not me. He's not somebody in the next room here. Jesus is somebody that God foreknew from before the foundations of the earth. He was promised to be a descendant of Abraham and a descendant of David. He was promised to be the king that would descend physically from David. He was born of a virgin through the power of Almighty God, and he did miracles and spoke through the power of God, like we mentioned in the book of Acts. These are signs and wonders which God did through him. He was sinless. He learned obedience through suffering. He who knew no sin became the sin offering for us. He's not a mere man. Let's keep going. He was put to death for our sin. He was raised from the dead by the power of God. Does this sound like a mere man? He's the firstborn from the dead. 
who sits now at the right hand of God Almighty in heaven. He is the, I think I've used the word before, he's the, the fulcrum or the only way that we will have entrance into the age to come, in the kingdom that is going to come. And this is another thing that we need to emphasize. Our hope, which Jesus began to preach, this one. See, here's another way he's not a mere man. He preached the gospel of the kingdom like nobody else ever has. This was his message. People, there's good news. This is the gospel. God has a plan. He will rule on this earth. I'm going to be the king, right? Jesus is going to be the king, he's stating. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. He will come to rule this earth. All power and authority in heaven on earth is given him. Now, does that sound like a mere man? So please, friends in the past, and if, you, if you're a Trinitarian and you have uh, people that believe in the one God of the scriptures and his Messiah, Jesus, don't ever accuse them of being uh, thinking that Jesus is a mere man. Right, right. He's not just another guy. He's not a dude. I mean, Jesus is the, I like to use the term, quintessential. He is the, the quintessential human. He is the second Adam. He is the representative Israelite, the representative human who, as our leader, does right everything that he ever did so that he's able to, through his life, set right everything that was wrong and open a way up for the rest of us to follow in his steps. So, I mean, yeah, I, this this is uh, almost like an ad hominem attack where you're, where you're just sort of like throwing out insults. You're like, oh, you, you just think Jesus is another guy or another man. He's not even special. I mean, come on. Come on. Mm. We, we, believe, we believe, along with the Bible, that Jesus had a virgin conception, that he walked on water, that he did all the things that you just mentioned. I mean, please, don't, don't come at us with uh, that we, we don't think Jesus is awesome, all right? Because yeah. we do. <laughs> We're quite He's taken with him. <laughs> He's our Lord and Messiah. Right, right. Every but, knee will bow. Yeah, Every but at the same guess. time, we're trying to be biblical, and we're trying to s- stop speaking where the Bible stops speaking and speak where it, it's clear. And these theories that originated later, centuries later, were and, and developed and evolved over time, I don't see why we should have to believe in them in order to be orthodox, in order to be in, in tune with what the Bible teaches everywhere else. Um, and yet there's a lot of negativity pointed at people like you, Bill, and me, who do not see the Trinity as the best explanation of what the Bible teaches, the biblical theology of God and of Christ and of the Holy Spirit. We just don't see it as being a very good explanation or theory because it's logically contradictory and confusing and it only works if you if you presuppose it and read it in. Mm. And even then, it there are so many confusing, conflicting, and difficult verses, not the least of which the ones that we covered already in the Gospel of John. Uh, that uh, you know, I, I don't. I think we should be able to cut each other some slack. So like, all right, you believe in the Trinity, so let's have let's have some dialogue. But sadly, all too often, people will just dismiss, just like this website that I, I cited in the beginning, that says, quote. Close your ears, um, yep. and end quote. And, and like that's just to me like what you said. It's an insecurity, and so I, I think you've taken a real stand here, Bill. And I I want to continue with this, and and look at some some more of the other common verses outside of the Gospel of John. But really, I mean, you've you've just covered ten major texts that some folks at least think and consider to be slam dunk texts that that clearly prove without any question that Jesus is God. And over and over, what, you, what I've heard you say is that, look at the context, Sean. Put your mind in the first century. Think like a Jew and see how it makes sense then, rather than thinking like a Presbyterian or thinking like a Baptist or a Catholic. And Ultimately, that's the task over and over again, is we want to put our minds into the world of the Bible and then read it the way they would want us to understand it, rather than 21st century America or whatever country you live in, reading that into the text. 
Absolutely. We need to do it. Language is a part of it. Look at it. If I tell an American, can you put this in your boot here? Take my lawn chair and stick it in your boot. The guy's going to look at me <laughs> and say, you know, what are you talking about? Like, it's not going to fit. If you say the same thing to a different English speaker in England, it means to put it in his trunk of his car. Right, right. So we want to understand the biblical language, the biblical mm-hmm. mindset, and this will enable us to right. understand the Bible. Sean, let me just say one other thing, and that is the scene might be changing in the sense that there are a lot of, I would say, new people that are coming to this understanding of the one God and his Messiah, Jesus, the anointed Jesus. And I think part of that is because of the internet, where now a person can hear a different opinion. We're not limited to just one pastor in a church that says this, you had to believe this, otherwise you're not going to be saved. And so that I believe it. Now we can, we can think about it a little bit ourselves, and we have at our fingertips ways to research. And I found in, in my own life that it seems to me, although it's, of course it's still a small minority, but there are many people, many people that are coming to this understanding. I, I hear about new people every day. I've just learned about a, another scholar. I'll hopefully uh, let you know about him here in, in the near future that has an organization. I never heard about it before. And they're, they're on the same page. And I, like I said, here's an, another guy doing a work. They're writing. They're very academic. They're very good thinkers, good communicators. And it seems daily new people are uh, on Facebook friends and new organizations and new small congregations. So there's, I think there's something going on here. And from what I understand, the people that have been in this faith uh, longer than I have, they, they see something. They see things picking up. There's a little bit of a, of a gaining of some steam here in the understanding of who the true God is and his Messiah, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, and it's an exciting time to be a part of this. Uh, as I like to say, this is a truth whose time has come. And there have been incredible attempts, I believe satanically inspired attempts, at snuffing out those who would question the old dogmas of the ancient church that have developed, especially in the late medieval period, and then following that. And let's be honest, the Protestant Reformation did not reconsider this question. There was no Reformation on Christology. There was no consideration of the central doctrine of the Trinity. And so, why not? Why not? Why, why can't we apply sola scriptura here? Why can't we use our God-given reason to consider this dogma? And if authority alone is sufficient for us to be beholden to this teaching, and I don't think it is. It's 500 years late, but uh, better mm. late than never. That's right. <laughs> and a lot yep. of times folks will say to me today, they'll say, oh, Sean, you know, there's no way. There's just no way. God would never let the church get off track that much for this long. And it's like, well, didn't they say the same thing to Martin Luther? Didn't they say the same thing to Ulrich Zwingli and to John Calvin and to their successors? Oh, there's no way that praying to saints is wrong. There's no way that that Mary is not the, the mediator and that we shouldn't recognize the Pope as the the authority of the church. I mean, there's no way. I mean, there's no way we could all be wrong. And you know what these early reformers said was, well, you know what? You've got your reasoning. You've got popularity. You've got prestige. You've got the money. And you've got the government. But I've got the Bible, and the Bible's enough. And so that's, that's where I'm going. You know what I mean? Yep. And, uh, you know, like Dale Tuggy likes to say, I'm just a little bit more Protestant than you are. Because... <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, we're just applying the same principles, but to everything, not just certain select salvation doctrines, but also these doctrines about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So yeah. thanks so much, anyhow, for uh, talking today, Bill, and uh, letting me put you in the hot seat there. I'm very uh, thankful that you were able to give us good answers to these, and I know that some listeners will, will say, oh, well, that's 
that that's old hat. I already knew that. And others will say, wow, this is really, really a comprehensive explanation. But because this is not something where we're, we're able to adequately go in depth on every one of these 10 texts that we've just looked at so far. So uh, I encourage you to, to, to think about it and pray about it and see what God teaches you. Uh, any, any last uh, remarks and th- or thoughts, Bill? Hey, Sean, thanks a lot. We're looking forward to the kingdom. <laughs> I am too. That's it for this part. Next time we'll look at a number of other scriptures from other places in the Bible. If you haven't yet, check out the previous episode in the Misunderstanding Text About Jesus series. Also, you may want to get Bill Schlegel's excellent book. Uh, it's a satellite Bible atlas. Very well done. It offers a chronology, a timeline of Scripture, as well as satellite pictures annotated so that you can actually know where things are. And I found it to be very helpful in my own preparation and Bible study. We'll see you next week, everyone. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.